Well, hi, Adiva. Hi, Nathan. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. So, um, did you know that NASA is sending people to the moon in 2024? Um, yes, I do. And how did you find out about it? From you? From me. <laughs> so I'm sort of spreading the word. <laughs> yes, and you're doing an awesome job at that. Now, if it wasn't for me, um, what would NASA have had to do in order for you to find out about it? Like, what should they be? Um... Uh, well, I think the best way is word of mouth, really, because we're so bombarded with information, um, and I don't think people are really taking as many, much information as they need to. I think word of mouth is great. So what you're doing is telling your friends, and if I get to know about it and I tell my friends, I think that's really the best way. Um, so what do you think about it? Uh, about like uh, I mean, NASA, NASA going. going. I mean, do you think it's a good thing, a bad thing? They should do something different. It's a waste of money. Um, well, I don't know. In I don't have enough information to come to that con uh, conclusion. But from what I know, from my my general basic understanding is we do have to um, find ways to um, you know make a better community or in a large extent the environment generally we need to make sure be more aware of how the environment is functioning global warming and stuff like that and I think that needs to be focused uh, pay more attention way more attention than we are doing at this point um, so whenever you say that needs a lot more attention and focus, like what are some things you think should be happening that aren't? Um, more projects, more uh, work on um, protecting the earth that we live in now. And um, I think we need to create more awareness and maybe NASA can help us with that. I'm not sure what kind of work they do, but if they have a program that we can align um, and bring more projects to help, I think that will help uh, a lot. Mm. And uh, any ideas on what these projects would be, or kind of um, like? Like, yeah, we if we have a really good weather forecast, what we have at this point, like for example, I live in Houston, and uh, we get, like it was my daughter's graduation party, and we all planned it out. It was supposed to rain, it didn't rain, and we waited, and it didn't rain, and so we canceled the party, and then so later on, it rained, but it wasn't that to that se severe level. Mm -hmm. So I think if you have more accurate information as to exactly how the weather is changing, if NASA took that initiative to let people know that there is really a serious problem or there isn't a serious problem. So we don't want to be living in a state of fear. Um, that's another problem because we feel that because we don't know enough, we don't have enough information, we tend to be more fearful. So mm -hmm. if NASA could help us, understand what the whole environment of the earth is really in and how as the as people of the earth we can work together to actually on a small grassroots level small nonprofits can help a lot i think so i think if we build that kind of initiatives and um, and i'm not sure if nasa can be a part of that but if they can that would be great hmm. um so there's this japanese billionaire and he's um paid elon musk uh, to build, you know, to, to contract out with them for, so Elon is working on this uh, space vehicle that will carry 100 people at a time to space. It'd be the cheapest to, to launch of any rocket. And uh, that's because it's 100% reusable. Right now, they kind of launch rockets and they throw them away. And anyway, this billionaire is planning to um, recruit like seven to nine artists so and he uses an artist in like the um the broadest sense so like fashion designer painter um you know musician film writer this type of thing and uh take them all on a trip around the moon and uh, in 2023 um what do you think about that um i think well the what really is the purpose of that well um the purpose is that artists are really good at communicating at a level um, that scientists and astronauts may not be able to, at a more emotional, empathetic level. Like, um, you know, if you look at some movies or a poem or a song, it has a way of uh, stirring your emotions and giving you a sense of something um, really deep and stirring. And the astronauts that went on Apollo 8 they were the first astronauts to go around the moon and see the Earth from the point of view of the moon, where the Earth is a small, you know, about the same size as the moon looks to us. And they 
that had a very a big impact on them in terms of um, realizing how finite and fragile and precious uh, and unified and um, you know how that the earth was one thing and you know they took a picture of it it's like that famous earth rise picture so this is in uh, 1968 um, by 1970 we had Earth Day it was our first Earth Day the EPA was founded around that time and a lot of people credit that one picture as being uh, the the thing that started the environmental uh, movement and um, so by sending artists there the idea is how could we essentially through these artists send all seven billion of us um, you know by having them come back and take their experiences and their emotions and and putting it into a, a work of art oh uh, we've not done that as yet uh, we've not sent artists to the, the moon, oh, okay. or even into oh, yeah, space. That's, yeah, okay, I uh, didn't know that. We um, had this teacher in space program um, where, uh, you know, we found the teacher, we put her on a shuttle, unfortunately it blew up, um, but then we send a, another teacher later on, but uh, after the teacher in space program, there's supposed to be like a journalist in space and maybe an artist in space, but we've never actually sent an artist. We did send the guy to the moon, who was an astronaut, and he came back and became an artist. So we did have that, so that's kind of good. But we've never sent like a group of artists uh, into space. Yeah, that would be wonderful, because I think yeah, from an artist's point of view, it would be something that will touch human beings a lot more. Um, I'm, I'm thinking what I've seen so far, if I've seen them from an astronaut point of view, it has touched me so much. If I'm going to see it from another perspective that I haven't seen yet, I don't know what that is going to be, but if I'm going to see something amazing, definitely it would be good. Um, I, there is this uh, famous uh, poet, I don't remember his name, but I, he had to get up on stage and, and give like a talk. And he was like so uh, nerve, you know, um, nerve wracked by it that he actually, you know, kind of threw up and couldn't go on stage and what have you. And uh, the person that was telling the story was saying, that's how you want your poets to be, very sensitive people that are, are like absorbing and responding and to like the environment. I also wonder, you know, like the artists going through like this very traumatic experience, um, if they might be more sensitive to it, but I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Um, 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 the other question is, would you go if, would, if space travel was as common and economical as saying going to New Zealand, um, is it something that uh, would interest oh, you? Oh yeah, yeah. If I could get to see the Earth from another perspective, I would love to. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the place that you know I live in, so I would like to see it from a different point of view. But yeah, would love to. I've seen the Earth on TV from outer space as a picture, but if there's um, something else that I don't know, I don't know what I don't know. So <laughs> I would love to. Yeah. Um, but I don't think I can manage the financial part of it as yet. Well, <laughs> I mean, let's say affordable. it's economical. You know, let's say $10,000 yeah. a person to go oh, into space, yeah. you know, something yeah. like that. I mean, it's not something that you could do like once a year, but <clears throat> it might be something that you'd be willing once to in do a lifetime, once sure. in a lifetime yeah. or what have you, you know. Um, have you ever been to Alaska? No. I haven't not either, yet. but I've been told it's beautiful and you have to go. But <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, what's the most interesting place you've been? Um, nature-wise, right? Or any place, like the, like the place that you're like recommend, everybody has to go do this before. Uh. Oh, um, that is a very interesting question. Um, I don't think I have been to a place that I can say everybody needs to go there. Mm. I think I've been to places where almost everybody I know has been is going or plans to go there. So nothing specific. Like I do want to go to um, the um, Himalaya or, um, you know, I do want to be somewhere like that. But I haven't been to anything specific like that. Mm. Yeah, I understand it's very popular and like the line to get like to the top of the Himalayas is like, you know, really crowded and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and so. I don't think I'm ready for that. <laughs> so, <laughs> nothing specific that, as far as, well, I haven't, I don't remember at least off my mind. Um, let's see. 
what do you think about asteroid impacts? Like, um, you know, every night, I, I mean, in Houston, you can't really see it because it's too much city lights. But if you go out into away from the city and it's a clear night, every hour you can see at least one meteor hit the Earth, you know, burn up in the sky and what have you. Um, and meteors come in all sorts of sizes. Um, you know, the dinosaurs were supposedly, um, you know, uh, extinct because yeah, of a yeah. big meteor impact. Um, like, what are your thoughts about that? Is that something that it makes sense to uh, map out and try to figure out how to protect Earth from oh, yes. big meteors? Yes, I think that would be an amazing thing if NASA wants to do that, or I'm sure NASA is already doing that. But yeah, it is an actually a real genuine threat, uh, a meteorite hitting us, a big size one. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we know that for sure. And what do you think about like global internet access? Um, you know, SpaceX is developing the Starlink uh, system that have thousands of satellites that are um, in low Earth orbit and can provide high speed internet access to any place on the Earth. Um, do you see that as being like a good thing or a bad thing or what's your feelings on that? I think before we, act, well, we are already uh, a lot more advanced already in the internet um, side of things. But I think we don't on a human level, we are still not ready for that kind of bombardment of information. Hmm. Um, not, not, we are not ready because we have to be also emotionally ready because if I see something on the internet that hurts me or affects my emotions and how am I going to process myself throughout the day and if this is happening to people at a much younger age where they don't know a lot about uh, their selves or they are not personally developed enough to handle their emotions then this will cause a big issue worldwide mm -hmm. and so we need to first work on the human beings because it is the human beings that makes things happen and if we, if we don't understand the importance of humans um, if we have a lot of technology, but not enough people ready to know how to use that, it may actually be a problem that we will have to face uh, in a more uh, drastic way that, than we're thinking at this point. I'm, I'm wondering about my next generation and my grandchildren, so I don't know how it's going to affect them. Um, like, I wasn't as much aware of the internet because it was the time when I was almost, like, matured, so it didn't affect me, but I see how my children how little things are there and I have to work with them to make sure that they understand what to, what to see and what not. So as on a small scale, I can work with my grandchildren to help them protect them and understand. But if it's too um, out there and if there is no such, you know, like real um, sort of like a firewall in a, in a proper way, but who sets the firewall, who does not, mm -hmm. those are big questions. I often thought, you know, if I could raise my children again, I would probably uh, go out into the country and have a farm, uh, like try to be as low tech as possible, and then introduce, I mean, I'm like even thinking maybe not even electricity and, you know, uh, running water and that type of thing. And then as they get older, introduce technology so that they really come to appreciate it and understand like its effect, you know, before and after. Um, I think that'd be really difficult for me to do, especially considering my children are grown. I don't plan to go through the experience again. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, and then plus also, this seems like a great idea uh, at the beginning, um, but it could also be like doing a single interview every single day for the next five years. Seemed like a really good idea at the beginning too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure how I'm going to feel about it in, uh, you know, a year or two from now. Um, but I mean, what are your thoughts? Like, if you could, like, raise, you know, children however, I mean, like, what would be, like, the best way um, to, like, raise children in today's world so that they understand kind of, like, the value, how to have personal connections? Because, I mean, like, even me, I find myself looking at my phone all the time, like, um, you know, email, uh, you know, uh, messages, uh, Facebook, Twitter, um, and it, you know, it's really kind of addictive and, you know, it, it, 
you like send an email and, and you look five minutes later like they haven't responded to me and you're like oh my gosh they're ignoring me yes yeah, so <laughs> it, it actually brings be doing a lot something. of stress in yeah. your life and then i'm sure the people that are your family members or people who are around you will feel that stress although sure. we don't realize that we share emotions on a different vibe our vibes or how we you know how we think about things people can read them even if you don't understand they can but they can right so um I think the best way is with technology has gone to a certain level and it's not going to come back and we have to accept that reality. Mm -hmm. But if I were to think about it deeply, I would say the school needs to do some work on it, not have kids carry phones. There's no need for them to have smartphones. They can just do with a flip phone, a regular phone. So for, for safety reason, they have a phone to reach out. And the school needs to make sure that the work that they're giving to the children is enough at the school. There's mm -hmm. no need for them to come home and study another four hours or six hours a day. Mm. And if someone is really out there and high achiever, they can do what they need to do, you know. They should have the program for them. Not everyone is out there made to be a high achiever. And the level of stress the school's putting on the children is not the right, right way. So like, if the school had the internet option, teach them what they need to teach, and that's it. There's no need for a laptop to be home. Hmm. And when they come home, the the if parents are both the parents are working, the children are exposed to the TV. So um, the TV needs the system that we have. The media needs to be aware of what they are doing, and there's some sort of a governance has to be established there because it's just crazy how things are. So there, the, so, so technology in our lives are taking over and messing us up, and I think that needs to stop. Yeah. And uh, when it comes to adults like us, um, if we have already, like if, if the next generation has already adopted itself so much into technology, they will have to purify themselves some way or the other, I don't know how. But there has to be a way because, you know, you can just have you know like as you said which i do as well i check my emails i'm constantly on my phone and i need to understand that it's not the way because if i'm if my mind and we all know our mind can only do one thing at a time mm -hmm. so now if i want to talk to my children or somebody special or my friend i want to take care of my neighbor or something which is a human being basic necessity is to interact with other human beings and at the same time my mind is actually attached to this device i'm basically doing I'm not really doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. So we need to be, as an adult, we need to coach ourselves. Um, otherwise, the problems that we will have, the reason why we have, we are having all these um, environmental issues and political issues and fights and wars and all that is because we don't really get it that we need to be humans first. And that's where yeah. we need to be, really, because really our minds is what created the technology. And if that gets messed up, we're not too far away getting totally messed up. So that's just a great, great part of this. <laughs> so I think we need to work on that. I know. I just don't see it getting better, though. Like, I mean, like, what are the drivers that, like, make it better? Because, I mean, like, the media, they don't care about children. They don't care about families. They don't care about community. Um, you know, maybe people that work there that do. But, I mean, as a system, if you look at the drivers, the drivers is all about selling ad revenue and all about making money all about making money and then that, that's true with pretty much all aspects of our society it's it's that's um you know what should you become well what makes the most money you know i mean um i, I mean really at some point it feels like you have to turn around to what's worth doing and then how do you afford to do it you know it's really like the question but it seems like the emphasis in uh, at least american society is all about money making and you know kind of doing getting the most for like the least and i don't know well there are a lot of countries in europe um let me see for example um, germany mm -hmm. i do think that they have a better system than us um or um italy for example i i do think people do take a lot of time to be more uh, relaxed uh, so we need to look into like for Poland, for example, has the one of the best education system. They don't have that homework, so they're not stressing their children. But what, what I mean, whenever you say it's the best um, education system, like, I, how do you figure that out? I mean, like, 
what are some measures that you would look at to um, see if it was the best education system? Well, I haven't done that research myself, but from what I hear, when they do that top 10 most developed countries and their education system, somehow comes out to be Poland is one of them. Oh, I see. So I don't know exactly what the criteria is. Is it because they are more smarter at how they work or the children are more relaxed? What is their level of um, uh, calibrating that? I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. I can look into it and find out. But I'm just thinking that there are, like, especially in America, we're more focused with work. And so we get stressed out. And that's because, um, you know, it's because we all go for the American dream. But I don't even understand really what the American dream is. Um, so. I know. <laughs> I've kind of I lost sight of it myself, too. Um, so, yeah, I know, like, safer environment, good, hosp good, you know, medical, good education for your children. But if I look at them, safer environment, am I really safe? Good education. Am I really, my kids are really getting the best education? I don't know. And what is education? Is it just being able to find the right choice among multiple choice answers? Or is it like refining the human mind somehow so you can really appreciate the world around you and see deeply inside of it? And this idea I think of, that's what edu good education is. When you you really build a mind in such a way that the mind is ready to progress in a healthy way, you know, like it's not just about some answering some questions. I know, like, uh, and then also the idea that you're stack ranking everybody all the time. You're number three and you're number 10 and you're number 20. So there's a competition. It is a competition, but also on top of that, uh, by what metric, you know, I mean, somebody may be very creative, uh, you know, in terms of like art and some people might be able to motivate other people and some people... And that's how it is supposed to be, right? Yeah, but you know, it, it all gets boiled down to grades and it's it's not about did I, did I uh, learn biology and do I really understand how to like go out and, and like look at a tree and decide if it's healthy and uh, how it's actually growing. Uh, no, it's, uh, you know, did I make an A on the test? and. If I made an A and I don't know anything, then that's good. If uh, I made an F and know everything, then that's bad. You know, it's like, yeah. Uh, yeah. kind of. Yeah, I think a lot of, um, I think as we are developing and calling ourselves educated people, we really need to sit back and, and I think it starts with the school mm -hmm. because that's where you start your education and obviously starts with the family as well. You, you can't just take, do only one part of it. So like, for example, if the mothers or whoever, the mother or the father who needs to take care of the child, the system, the work system that we have needs to appreciate that, needs to compensate for that some way or the other. Um, mm -hmm. if, if we don't have that system, it doesn't work because you won't be able to raise good human beings uh, if you don't have good nurturing family. Yeah. So all that needs to come in. I think it's important to understand what do we really need? Do we need more things or do we need better people? I think we definitely need better people. And, um, you know, another interesting thing, uh, another little tidbit. In 1969, when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon, you know how many people there were in the world? How many there? 3.5 billion, about. Okay. And you know how many there are now? Seven? Mm -hmm. Nearly double. Mm, in it's, 50 years? In 50 years. I that's, just, a, that's a huge number I know. for 50 years. <laughs> it is a huge number. Yeah. Um, and if you look at uh, people in America, um, I mean, there's like no starvation because of lack of being able to produce food. I mean, we're like really wasteful. And, yeah. you know, we, we throw out lots of food. Um, a lot of poor people aren't hungry as much as maybe obese, right? I mean, yeah. it's kind of because of our high sugar diets that we have and what have you. And it feels like that we have the technology to actually feed the entire world um, and nobody would have to be hungry. I mean, the thing is, um, somehow in a matter of 50 years, we doubled the population and more than doubled the, the food supply, I, I think. I mean, I don't know. I've never ever really felt like famine would be a risk that we would have, mm. you know. I never felt like um, lack of shelter or, or anything like this 
Um, but I mean, around the world, that's not the case. A lot of people are starving. Yeah. A lot of people, um, you know, have very violent lives. I mean, going to the supermarket is uh, can be dangerous in the United States if you're, you know, driving on the road. But, you know, people don't think it's a real danger. But, I mean, if you're, like, in uh, some countries in, like, um, the Middle East or in Africa or in, you know, Asia or what have you, um, you know, just going about your normal life has a whole bunch of dangers that we don't have to experience. Yeah. And um, it's just like... Um, you know, if you look at like the 1900s, uh, we had World War One, which was a very big deal for uh, Europe and the United States. And I read one author that said that he felt like the reason World War One happened was because that there was a perception that um, there's a limited amount of resources, and either we have them or other people have them. And so if we want to make sure our future is good, we need to go and secure all these resources. So you had uh, Germany essentially, um, you know, uh, had the war to go and try to secure the other resources. And then World War II, you pretty much had the same idea. And right now you have like a big emphasis on border building, like walls and what have you, which I think largely is driven by this idea that there's only so much um, stuff in the world and either we keep it to ourselves or we're gonna lose it, that type of thing. But uh, the same author pointed out, there's no such thing as a natural resource. There's only raw materials and it's the human creativity and our ability to um, turn these raw materials into resources that allow for us to have the life that we have like land isn't a resource until you know how to plant seeds and grow crops right oil so isn't... it's the intelligence of the human mind that's more important right uh, which means that with each human you add you should be increasing your resources because now you have one more mind looking at it and what yeah. have you yeah oh um don't worry guys i'll continue this going a bit <laughs> yeah so that that's true well um you know, I believe, as a, from my spiritual learning, is if God sends a human being, he sends resources. Or he sends enough for the person to sustain. Otherwise, this wouldn't happen. So, from that point of view, I do... That's just from my spiritual point of view. But in reality, I also think if whatever we have, we got to figure out a way to work. And that requires people with a um, sense of empathy. Uh, sense of understanding and um, idea of collaboration and knowing how to communicate and not just backstabbing each other and that is probably is what we need we need human beings you know like really human beings so if yeah. you have more of that and the world will change automatically and it's really in the mind like you know we do um, in you know you we where does the mind actually come from? It does come from a certain source, right? And we are, we do connect with that. It's not like we are separate and just somehow it's coming. It's coming from somewhere and everyone's probably tapping that somewhere. And so hmm. every one of us is a part of that somewhere. We got to figure out a way to just be connected. I think that's where the challenge is at this point. There's this uh, science fiction author. He wrote The Martian. I don't know if you've heard about the movie, uh, The Martian. Yeah, no. Um, they, they had, um, oh, I've, I think, uh, anyway, I, I forgot who it, who it had in it. But, uh, yeah, okay. Um, uh, but anyway, he wrote a story called The Egg, where uh, this guy uh, dies and he meets God. And um, he discovers that the world is really meant to um, let us grow as individuals. But it's even more fundamental than that, that we aren't like a collection of individuals, but we're actually the same individual, uh, it, you know, um, growing um, like um, you and I are actually the exact same person. And every person that ever lived is the same person. Every person that's ever in the future is like 
the same person. And so like whenever we're good or bad to each other, we're really being good or bad to ourselves and you know, we're perpetually learning from it. But it's called the egg and I think you might really enjoy it actually. It's a little, they turned, there's been a couple of um, uh, short plays done on it, but it's, it's pretty neat. We'll have to watch it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Well, I think I could probably talk to you forever. Yes, same here. <laughs> same here. <laughs> but I think we probably have to get on to some other things. Too. <laughs> no problem. I enjoy talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your time. Oh, you're more well, most, most welcome. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway. All right, then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.